Hi, I'm James from Chaosium. When I sat down with Mike Mason a few weeks ago, we talked about his experience writing for different creatures in the Cthulhu Mythos, and how some of them have very straightforward story arcs, whereas some need more creative interpretation. This clip begins just after I asked him what his favourite creature in the Cthulhu Mythos was. Take a look. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like many of them, obviously, but um, for me personally, um, being... I guess being English and um, having a, and growing up at the time when uh, what's now turned like folk horror was really kind of bubbling away in the 1970s, things like The Wicker Man, uh, Blood on Sla Satan's Claw and so forth, those kind of films. Um, I've always been interested in the, and then kind of like the folkloric kind of side of things and how, um, how our myths and legends um, you know, could, in, you know, if you look at them a certain way, could be inspired or, or in, infected by the mythos in some way. So um, for me, the, the number one kind of deity that kind of like really kind of exemplifies that is Shub And um, uh, because, you know, it's very easy to kind of, you know, um, associate that deity with like, you know, kind of ancient fertility rites and, and um, you know, crop, crop ceremonies and, uh, weird nature and the the dark woods and all that kind of thing which for me is really cool and so I think there's a lot of potential there uh, and that's just you know the kind of straightforward angle on that particular deity you can go many other ways with it um and uh, but I think um um you yeah, know the, the 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 dark goat of the woods in that sense is is uh, an interesting deity because it's not it's not completely removed it's not existing out in space although it is it does kind of touch, yeah. You know, has a, has a physical manifest manifestation on Earth when you want it to. It's not as a thought. Who, if he comes to Earth, he, the Earth will kind of just get killed. Yeah, uh, it, it's a, a kind of a limit, more limited form of, of of mythos danger in that sense. So it works quite well for the game in that way. I absolutely love that. I I I think that's a great answer. Is there a creature that? you've had a more difficult time really connecting with and understanding the horror behind. Obviously everyone is scared of different things and everyone's excited about different things. Is there a creature who you've felt the stories, you know, other people have needed to come to you with ideas about them, maybe more than them arising naturally or something like that? I think the great thing about the Cthulhu Mythos is that it, it, it is just a massive bag of ideas. And, and I think most you know, I, re I rarely, and I rarely meet writers who find it difficult coming up with some cool idea about any of these kind of creatures. Um, but um, <clears throat> I guess um, there are certain creatures that, that kind of had a hard time um, in terms of like being horrifying or, or how they have tended to be characterized over the years. And there's two that spring to mind on the, on the kind of the, the God scale, uh, Sothogua, um, I think is a really cool and interesting kind of deity. But the fact that Clark Ashton Smith kind of kind of described it as a big toad, people have kind of hooked onto that. And so a lot of representations and, and ones we've done as well have kind of got that toad-like aspect. And in one sense, you can think, oh, that's really cool. But on the other sense, it looks like a big frog and it's not mm. that scary. So um, trying to find ways to kind of reimagine Sothogua to be, you know, because it's only toad-like, it's not a toad. Yeah. So um, that kind of can cause some problems. And the on the monster level, um, we've done quite a lot of work on the sand dwellers because, again, because they were kind of like, again, kind of almost described like koala-like, they tend to be seen as these kind of big kind of fluffy teddy bears that aren't really scary, or, and they, or they're a bit kind of naff. Um, so... You know, when you think about the sand dwellers and the background to them, actually, it's again really cool. They've got this kind of great hive under the ground. They they're infatuated by kind of crystals and gemstones, and and uh, it's a whole kind of society which is really interesting that that tends to get ignored or forgotten about. And so, um, uh, particularly wrote things like uh, the books like uh, Terra Australis, where we do a lot of work on the sand dwellers. Uh, to kind of make them more scary again and to give them a bit more kind of, you know, uh, agency and relevancy in the game. So they're not just these things that pop up in the desert that, you know, most investigators rarely go out to the desert. So when are we ever going to see a sand dweller? 
well, you know, with the Great Hive, you can have entrances coming up in the middle of cities or in the par in the park or the farm or whatever. It, it, it's, you know, they're called sand dwellers, but that's only a name. It doesn't mean they only dwell in the desert. So um, trying to kind of, you know, broaden these things out and, and throwing more ideas and to kind of try and, you know, make make them terrifying really in a way you know imagine this kind of race of subterranean kind of thin kind of slender man type creatures lurking under the city that can come out at any point to grab you is quite scary oh, rather than yeah you know, a bunch of koalas living in the desert yeah, <laughs> not so, scary. so it's that kind of thing trying to trying to rethink a few things and trying to emphasize points that have maybe been um you know, not really developed in, you know, previous iterations. So it's a lot about figuring out a new creative way or a different way of thinking about uh, some of these ideas or just being more open to the different permutations. Yeah, I think so. And I think that's, you've really got to approach the Cthulhu mythos in that kind of light, in my mind, because it isn't one thing. There isn't a canon. It isn't cohesive and whole. It is um, a mishmash of ideas. And I, you know, I take a very simple premise that because we're humans, we can never understand this. So that's why it's a mishmash of ideas, because we have our different interpretations based on different perceptions, based on different information and that, that, that can be gathered. Um, and all of them contra contradict and make no sense, which is just like another way of saying as a soft, it doesn't make sense. So, um, yeah, that, that, yes, absolutely. That, that is the kind of, uh, a great way to kind of think about it because it, it frees it up and it allows for cool and off the wall ideas which is you know um something you know we we like to uh to work with